Welcome to section 15.4, summarizing, describing, and comparing data distributions. This is a very long section, so it will be covered over several videos. Here are the topics and objectives, the standards, and vocabulary. So when we collect data, we don't expect all the data to be the same. And in fact, one of the requirements of those statistical questions is to anticipate variability. So if we, if a state gave a test to all fourth graders, the test scores will vary from student to student. If a company measures the amount of mercury in cans of tuna fish, the amount will likely vary from can to can. So we have seen that we can summarize a set of numerical data with a single value, that mean or median, and that gives us an idea of what's typical or representative. But two sets can have the the same mean or median and be distributed very differently across a dot plot or histogram. For example, you might think of it as, um, you know, they could be really close together, you know, you've got a lot of dots in one place, or they could be really spread out. And that's what we're talking about here when we talk about variability is how consistent or close together is the data or how f spread out or far apart the data is. We often call numerical data that are dis displayed in a dot, a dot plot or histogram a data distribution. And in this section, we're going to examine some shapes that they take. And we're also going to look, so we're going to look at the common shapes. We're going to study some statistical tools for summarizing how data is distributed. And we're going to be talking about percentiles. Now, you're probably not going to teach K through 8 percentiles, but you're going to receive reports about your students' performances on standardized tests in terms of percentiles. So it's important for you to understand how to read and receive those reports. And those are in terms of normal distributions, and we'll be covering that briefly at the end. So a large set of numerical data often has a particular type of shape when it's plotted in a histogram or dot plot. So the overall shape can give us some insight into that data. So before you're going to move on, you're going to complete our exploration to get a sense of data distribution shape. So remember, don't forget these. Pause, complete them, take as much time as you need. Pause here for this exploration, and when you're complete, press play. So let's first talk about skewed data distribution. So when we talk about skewed, we're looking at those data distributions with a long tail that extend to the right or to the left. So these are called skewed to the right if the tail is all the way to the right and skewed to the left. So we're kind of looking at this tail here. This would be skewed to the right and this would be skewed to the left. So if we're talking about heights of a tree, the majority of trees may be about the same height. So if we kind of see here, these are kind of like about the same height, but maybe there's not enough sunlight for those new trees. And so um, it may be skewed to the left. So a histogram would be skewed to the left, but if most fish in a lake are really, really small and there are far fewer large fish, so there would be fewer large fish, then the smaller fish, we're gonna see it skewed to the right. We can have bimodal data. So if you think about kind of breaking this up, bi meaning two, think about a bicycle, modal meaning our mode. And so that's what a bimodal is gonna look like. It's gonna have two or more peaks and those peaks kind of represent the most. So we can see, okay, we've got a lot here and we've got a lot here and that's gonna make this data bimodal. Symmetric data, you can think back to our concepts of symmetrical, they're kind of symmetrical, right? It may have some low and then it gets a little higher, kind of peaks out and then comes back down. Let's do an example here. So the three histograms show the hypothetical performance of students in three different school districts on the exact same test. A score below a 40 is considered failing. So below a 40 is failing. So there's failing below a 40. Let's just kind of label what we've got here. And a score of 80 is, or above is considered excellent. So we'll just put a smiley face. 80 or above is considered excellent. All right, so estimate the mean score on the test for each school district by viewing the mean as a balance point. All right, so let's take a peek here. We think back to a balance point, think of it as like that seesaw. So where would we want to put that seesaw? And we'd probably want to put the seesaw for A right about there. So we might give that a score, a mean score of 50. 
And then for B, where would we want to put the seesaw? Maybe right here, but in the middle, right? Like right in the middle would be there. So that might be uh, 55. And then C, it looks like these are, it's skewed over here to the left. So we're going to want to keep our balance more over here. So maybe it would be like this, kind of all those would add up and balance those two out. So maybe, maybe even right there, maybe like 70, 75. So discuss what information you can glean from the histograms that wouldn't be apparent just from knowing the mean or the median. So I can look at the data distribution, the way the data is um, kind of moving out. So for B, I could say, hey, we don't have a lot of failures, right? I wouldn't know that from the mean, but from here I could see that B has very few failures. And then for C, I could see that we have a lot, like kind of more failed, right? We've got a, like a lot of failures, but we also have a lot of excellent. So I can see that from the distribution, not from the mean. The mean doesn't really tell me that. What about um, discuss how they could argue that each one did better than the other? So what would A say? A might say, more students passed, right? They don't have a lot of failures here. If we kind of look um, here, they might say more students passed. They have a good chunk over here that passed, right? That might be their claim to fame. What might B say? Well, B might say we have like almost no failures, right? Almost no fails. And what might C say? C might say, look how excellent most of our students. We have a lot of excellent. So when we look at the distribution, we can say a lot about the data that has nothing to do with the mean or the median. You go ahead and give this a try. Press play when you're ready to see the solution. And there we go. Complete this exploration. It's six questions. It's over a few different slides here. So press play when you're ready to see the next two and pause. Press play when you're ready to see the next two. And these are the final two of that exploration. Press play when you are complete. So we're going to be talking about characteristics of distributions arising from random samples. So suppose a population is divided into two categories, and maybe we're going to talk about the population is light bulbs produced and the categories would be defective or not defective. Or the population could be deer, and the category could be infected, not infected. So for simplicity, let's think of the population as voters, and let's say the categories are yes and no. So the voters will vote for or against a certain referendum. Now, suppose we take a bunch of reasonably large random samples of the same size, and in each case, we determine the percentage of the sample that voted yes, and we plot them. An amazing and very useful fact is this. The random samples tend to form a distribution that is symmetric about the percentage of yes votes in the full population. So furthermore, the larger the sample size, the more tightly clustered the data distribution tends to be around its center of symmetry. And so these facts about random samples allow statisticians to use samples to make predictions with a certain degree of confidence. And the details about making predictions predictions is something you study in the statistics class, but we're going to kind of just discuss it briefly here. So if we notice that both of the distributions here are symmetrical, they have approximately the same mean or balancing point and approximately the same median. So although the shape and the median, excuse me, the shape mean and median are useful, it's not really enough to distinguish them because they're all pretty similar. So they, the two distributions are distinguished by how dispersed they are. If you kind of look here, we can see that it's kind of spread out from mid thirties all the way to 55, where this is only spread from 40 to 55. So these are more spread out than this. So we can summarize the difference in dispersion with measures of variation the way things are spread out or differ. So at a math center in a class, there is a bag filled with 40 red blocks and 10 blue blocks. Each child in the class of 25 will do the following activity. Randomly pick 10 blocks out of the bag without looking and write on one sticky note the number of red blocks and the number of blue blocks. Describe a good way to display the data for the whole class. Your proposed display should be realistic and practical way for us to show. All right, so we could probably say we could use like a double bar graph 
because we could kind of compare like the red and the blue blocks. And we could do a dot plot, maybe. And we could probably do a pictograph. Although that wouldn't be great because that's better for categorical data, right? So we probably want to stick with either a double bar graph, double bar graph, or a dot plot. So sketch a graph that could be the graph you proposed and briefly describe the characteristics you expect to have. All right, so let's, let's do a few. Okay, so um, because we, let's look, let's do a bar graph here. So remember that for bar graphs, we've got frequency over here. And so this is our first child is gonna grab. And maybe, how, how are they gonna, how would I know how many red and blue? So maybe let's go back and think about what we might expect the graph to look like. So if we know that there are 40 red and 10 blue, there are 50 total. And so there are 40 over 50 red and 10 over 50 blue. So it's more likely just by looking at that that we're gonna get more red than blue. And if we were to do 40 over 50, we would get 0.8. So 80% are red, which means there's 20% left for blue. So I would expect that every time a child kind of reached their hand in to get 10 blocks randomly, that they're probably going to get eight red and two blue. Now, they're not going to get that many each time, but that's just kind of likely. So if we say here frequency 4, 6, 8, 10... So maybe the first child, maybe they get seven red. And maybe then they've got three left for the blue. Right? Three left for the blue. And then maybe the next kid, they get eight red, just like we expected, and two blue. And we could do it like that. And maybe instead we're going to do a dot plot where we just look at the blue. So this would be the blue picked out of ten. And then we're going to say, okay, I, I don't, because I didn't want to go to 25 here. That makes me sad. So you can get at most 10 blue out of a pick, right? 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? When you go in for 10 blocks, you can maybe get all of those 10 blue blocks. So what would I expect? The first, I expect the blue to, two blues to be picked a lot. Like I expect a lot of students to get two blues. And probably a lot to get one, right? There's not that many. Maybe three. And I expect fewer and fewer to kind of get these. I don't really expect that, right? So maybe that's what the data distribution looks like. So I would expect something like this. Go ahead and give this a try. Press play when you're ready to see the solution. Continue on to this exploration. Press play when you're complete. And that concludes our first part of section 15.4.